Super, I'll try to do that. I've just started the recording, so that should be okay. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so this session is about leading in a time of crisis. And if you could move the slide on, please, Zoe. So the background, what we want to do today is to share a little bit of research that we have begun. So we haven't, this is research which is still in progress, but the background to what we are doing, um, I'm going to share with you now. So in Scotland, since 2016, there's been a review of education. So the Scottish Government have initiated what's been known as a governance review or an, the empowerment agenda, as it's sometimes been known as. Um, the focus very much of this has been to reduce the poverty related attainment gap, which has become the rationale for the ensuing policy changes that have been happening over the past uh, few years. One of the changes has been around developing a head teacher's charter and the, the mandatory nature now of the into headship qualification for prospective head teachers. So the role of the head teacher has become increasingly pivotal as education systems take forward their improvement strategies. However, Scotland, like many other countries, are facing a recruitment crisis. The role of schools in shaping the life chances of learners is well established, as are the effects of social factors such as poverty, gender, race, and ethnicity. The COVID pandemic has highlighted the significant role that schools play in trying to address the divide between the more um, the more affluent and the and the more disadvantaged pupils. So school leaders can play a critical role um, in working to remove or reduce the barriers to learning and achievement. Side by side with this. Much now is known about the significance of leadership in raising expectations around pupil attainment and achievement and in fostering the conditions for effective learning. Questions have also been raised at an international level. So at this point, you, you could say that head teacher preparation, the role of the head teacher has never been as significant or perhaps as visible as it is at the moment, partly because of the COVID crisis. Um, but questions have been raised at an international level around the relevance and the focus of current leadership preparation programmes. So Harrison Jones in 2020 um, did some research and they raised, they raised some of the issues around how well people are being um, prepared for the role. So that's really the rationale for, for this research project is to look at how leadership practices and leadership learning of those on the into headship program so this is specific to the scottish context looking at people who are doing the program um, across scotland during the covid crisis how they have been impacted and we're focusing very much on their agency so this research has been conducted at a micro policy level through the lived experiences to look at the lived experiences of aspirant and serving head teachers the purposes the aims are to explore these lived experiences of people who have been on into headship, so you know, really engaged in professional learning while leading a school during the COVID pandemic crisis. And ultimately, we want to identify priorities for leadership development. So what can we learn from their experiences? What can we learn about leadership? And how can we develop our into headship program? Thank you, Zoe. So just a little bit then for for those of you who perhaps don't know um, who are not familiar with the into headship program you see into headship became a mandatory program from august 2020 the program is really designed to prepare suitably experienced teachers in scotland for headship the overall purpose of the program is to enable participants to develop the strategic leadership and management competences as specified in the standard for headship in Scotland. So to help them to, to transition from their role as principal teachers or deputies, primarily deputy heads, into the role of, of head teacher. The programme is very much a partnership. So it's a partnership between Education Scotland, local authorities and universities. Representatives from, from these three um, institutions work together in a design um, 
network and we meet regularly to discuss the programme so that there's continuity across Scotland, so that all the universities are working in tandem with the programme that they're leading. Recently, the programme was accredited, re-accredited by the GTC and it kind of was re-accredited with flying colours. So they were very pleased with all the work that, that's been going on and the partnership element was really highlighted. So Education Scotland, their function is to provide, to facilitate national conferences where the whole national cohort can get together. They also provide modules online. Local authorities provide support um, from their end and universities, obviously we are providing the academic side of things. Um, but we work very closely together. The programme revolves around two different courses. So the first course is developing as a strategic leader. So in that course, participants are asked to look at the, their ideas, the theory behind leadership practices, um, but also to look at their own values and also their own leadership styles to explore the kind of leader they want to be based on, on their reading and research and also to look at their school context and to problematize issues within their school as a potential area for change and then the second course which is leading strategic change this involves them then identifying a strategic change initiative so this is a, a long-term change that they want to introduce and um, looking at the wider policy aspects um, critically and focusing in on an aspect within their school that they want to develop and lead change in. So the one of the strengths I think of this programme is that it really does marry theory with practice. So it's about practitioners in their day to day jobs, leading schools, being informed by reading and research. And the aim of the, the programme and the courses is really to provide that time for that critical reflection. Um, you know, that, that's the aim to help leaders to make informed decisions when they, you know, in, in their school setting. It does involve critical engagement with policy and research, but ultimately it's about leading school improvement and it's about improving life chances of young people. Thank you, Zoe. So a bit then about our research methods and methodology. We're, we've come at this from an inquiry point of view, from an inquiry position, and we've used a pragmatic constructivist epistemology. So this is based on the work of Elgin and Goodman, and it recognises that the purpose of inquiry is not about seeking absolute truths, but it's about advancement of understanding. So we really want to get a, a seeking a deeper understanding of the subject at hand and the subject at hand in this case is the the into headship cohort we used the the last year's cohort cohort six um as, as a case study so we, we've adopted a case study approach and this we have used the national into headship cohort as a, as the the case study um, Yin recognises that the term case study can be used to describe a variety of approaches to research, but within this context, um, the, the case study is qualitative in nature. So we're, we're, in, we're interested in um, seeking the views, the experiences of those who have lived through the COVID pandemic, leading a school through the COVID pandemic, um, at, while also working on into headship. Case studies can provide examples of how people think and act in given situations. They're useful in understanding perceptions of individual participants and their interpretation of events. So that's why we chose to, to use this model of methodology. Another benefit of the case study approach to research is that it promotes an opportunity to examine people and events in detail rather than a broader piece of work, which might include a wider range of participants. So one criticism of the case study approach is that it's not generalizable but we what we want is a deep understanding of actually what's going on within the scottish context and within this particular cohort what their experiences have been so in this study the interheadship practitioners are the subjects and the interheadship program constitutes the frame so just a little bit about the participants then um the participants that we recruited where so we wanted participants across Scotland 
So um, we, we chose to work with people from Glasgow, the University of Glasgow, the University of Edinburgh, and also participants from the University of Aberdeen to give that wide overview of experiences. And we chose people who were um, some deputy heads and some people who were acting heads as well. But perhaps Zoe can say a wee bit more about the, the, um, the makeup of the participants later. So as such, this is a single collaborative case study approach rather than a comparison across the three institutions. So we're not interested in the differences between the different um, institutions, but what we want to look at is you know, the themes coming through across the cohort, um, the national cohort. Another reason for using a case study approach is because it allows a holistic perspective and deep description of the participants' experiences in their context to be examined. And this is crucial for understanding the issues and challenges facing Scottish school leaders during the COVID crisis. So the method used uh, to gather the data, what we did was we used questionnaires. Um, so questionnaires were sent to, well, first of all, um, everybody in the three institutions on cohort six, so that was last year's cohort, were asked if they would take part in the research. Um, they were sent an online questionnaire and it was up to them whether they engaged with it or not. The questionnaires were anonymous, so if they didn't want to, you know, to, uh, to be involved further, that was absolutely fine. If they wanted to then go on and um, offer to be interviewed or agree to be interviewed, they would put their name um, and their contact details on the questionnaire. So we got a, a number of questionnaires back and some people did agree to be interviewed. And the stage that we're at just now is that we have looked initially at the questionnaires. We've looked um, at some emergent themes which have come through and we have also carried out interviews. We have noted some, you know, some things that seem to resonate with, with what we found in the questionnaires, but we're not at the stage yet of having uh, analysed all the data. But what we want to do today is really to share with you some of those emergent findings uh, from the, the interviews, that we've, the questionnaires rather that we've carried out and some of the, the things that have come through from interviews so far. Um, we're going to use thematic analysis uh, to, to identify codes and themes based on the work of Ron and Clark. And we also want to use um, a model of agency, which I'll maybe just talk you through on the next slide. Thank you, Zoe. So I don't know if you're familiar with the work of um, Priestley and colleagues, but this is a model of agency that um, we thought we could perhaps frame our findings around uh, when, you know, when we get to that stage of the data analysis. So this agency model, um, it's based on teacher agency, but we're using it as leader agency, if you like, or head teacher agency. And what um, I particularly like about this model is that it shows the complexity of educational leadership. So agency here is viewed not as a capacity that someone has, you know, it used to be, people used to talk about leadership traits, that if you had certain traits, you would be a good leader which is a very simplistic view, perhaps, but actually within educational leadership, there are a myriad of factors which can enhance or impinge on someone's agency and ability to lead. So here, agency is the ability to, um, to do what you want to do, if you like. So here, agency, would, in terms of leadership, the agency of someone to be able to lead strategic change um, is impinged or enhanced by all of these different factors. Um, so in this model, we see here iterational factors. So life histories, the, the life history that someone has, the experiences that they've had of perhaps um, leadership opportunities or confidence building, um, the professional histories, the, the education, the professional development that they've engaged in, all of these things, all of these experiences will affect how they see themselves as a leader and what what kind of leader they want to be, the values that they have. So this will affect what they do and, and how they do it. Um, in this model as well, what you know, the practical evaluative section, I think, is very relevant for leaders within the school setting, 
So if you think of, you know, the culture, cultures can be very different within different schools. Um, if you think about a leader who goes into a school, they don't know the staff, that they, they're a new head teacher going into an, a, a new school. Um, the ideas, the values, the beliefs of the staff, the pupils, the community that they go to might jar with their own values and beliefs. And, and head teachers and leading change, it can take time to, you know, align values to, to, to um, create that shared vision. So all of these things have an effect on, on how quickly change can happen um, and, and how, you know, how well and sustainable change can be. There are structural factors that have got to be considered. So social structures within the school, relationships, roles, um, power, trust, and also material factors can impinge or enhance agency as well. Thinking about, you know, spaces for uh, collegiality, for example, um, or lack of space, lack of resources, lack of money to buy, you know, things that are needed to support school improvement. So if you think about the school context, all of these things can impinge or affect the agency of the school leader. But also the school leader works within the wider environment of the local authority. So again, there's a culture, there's a structure, and there are material um, factors which impact at local authority level. Um, so all of these things affect what someone can do as a leader. And again, the arrows show that the iterational factors link into the practical, evaluative and also projective. So again, you know, the, the, the aspirations that the leader has for where the school is going, for where they're going, their short term, their long term goals, all of these things are um, affecting the agency of, of the school leader. So I, I think what this model um, we're, we're trying to, to show using this is the complexity of educational leadership. It's not like leading, you know, a, in a business setting, perhaps, but actually leading within a school is, is leading within a complex ecosystem. And all of these things, um, are, you know, affect what leaders are able to do. So the idea is that once we um, find our emergent themes, we would like to map our themes against this model of agency um, so that we can see areas that can inform and help us to develop our leadership preparation program to enhance the agency of head teachers. So ultimately we, we want to identify areas within this model um, so that that inform what we do so that head teachers um, and future you know school school leaders, uh, will have will be able to take perhaps ownership of agency and to um, to be able to be as agentic as possible. Thank you, Zoe. Thanks, Julie. Um, and I'll just go back to you said the the profile of our participants just before I pick up from where you left off with the agency. So. As you, you noted, we had a number in the survey and then those that we interviewed, um, we tried to ensure that we had a broadly kind of typical representative sample um, of the participants across the cohort and across those who um, engaged in the survey. So of the six interviews that we have done, the in-depth interviews that we've done, and we took quite a narrative approach in those interviews to get as much rich data as possible in there. Um, there was a balance of, of male and female. Um, we had four primary based colleagues and two secondary based colleagues. And we had four people who were in substantive DHT posts one of whom is now taken up a head teacher post and two others who were in who are now in substantive head teacher posts either during or um, recently upon completion of into headship. Um, so we have I think a broad range across the authorities that were represented in each of the cohorts and across the um, general profile of participants overall. So as Julie has said, you know, we're obviously really interested in this concept of agency and how it's experienced and achieved and enacted as individuals are engaging in their own leadership development and indeed that leadership practice. And I think 
in the data that we have so far in the analysis that we've begun to do, we can start to really see that complex interplay between the dimensions of the ecological model that Julie's just described and how we understand agency as part of that leadership development. And of course, we're at the very early stages of data analysis, and we want to use this session to kind of share some of that analysis and then get into some good discussion around how that's maybe experienced or seen by others to help us build and, and move forward in some of that thinking. So we've been looking at the emerging themes across both the survey and interview data and starting to interrogate these using uh, the lens of complexity and the, the ecological model of agency. Um, and in today's session, we want to share what those kind of headline themes are as they stand at the moment and try to illustrate some of them through what I'd maybe describe as the micro stories from the participants um, interviews or data from the survey. And whilst there's two aspects that we're looking at that are distinct, um, they are also absolutely interrelated. So there's the issues specific to the leadership learning, in particular that learning in the into headship preparation program and the leadership practice. And in particular, what that's meant and felt like um, and experienced during the COVID crisis and how some themes are absolutely emerging and influencing in both areas. And so we're really interested in how those threads of agency evolve through that data and through those experiences. I think one thing that was really clear from the data, and this is a reassuring thing for us to begin with here, um, is that it was evident from both the survey and the interview data, the engagement on the Interheadship Programme had a clear perceived impact on the individuals involved and their own development and emerging professional identity and their practice as a leader or um, head teacher. And they were reporting that this learning experience had really given them what they needed to be a head teacher, to apply for those head teacher positions, or to take forward um, their leadership in a new school as a newly appointed head teacher. And one illustrative example from the data was one participant who described it as, you know, really now being able to understand what I was doing better, to know and understand my own actions and have a better base of knowledge. And he said, whilst you learn every day on the job, this, the internship experience, has really helped to deepen my understanding and it's really been about shaping my own identity, giving me the confidence and the broader perspectives to be able to make my own judgments. And for us, this is kind of quite illustrative and the, the example that alludes to that sense of developing agency as a leader and what the, the aspects of the programme and that learning have done to help in that process. But of course, this is also something that we hear quite commonly in into headship and really want to dig in a bit deeper um, and unpick what does that actually mean? What are the dimensions of this that are making a difference? What does that look like and what features really support and enable and where are their key challenges or barriers in the process? Um, and on the slide here, what we've done is try to identify um, the kind of big messages and how we've seen them um, come through in both the practice and the, the leadership learning. And I'm going to briefly reflect on some of these, pull out some critical points that we would like to highlight before we open up for some discussion. So two critical aspects of the leadership learning, um, we see that kind of forming around this notion of what is the masters-ness of interheadship. Um, so really those ideas of the criticality, the challenge, that developing the depth of knowledge, knowledge and that really important, and uh, Julie's already touched on this, the practice theory, and it's the interwoven dimension of the theory and practice that is a really critical part of into headship. Um, and a big message throughout the whole uh, data, all the data that we have, was this isn't just about having readings or access to literature and theory. It's not just about it being an academic piece of work, but it's very much about that interplay between the criticality, the knowledge, the understanding, and that these are aspects that are really core to developing sense of agency. And so the theory practice, the um, research literature, they're all interrelated, um, but they are not just in the domain of the programme, the academic, the learning. They are also absolutely an integral part of practice. And we heard how these played out in both 
um, of these dimensions of the, the leadership journey. Um, one participant described it as needing to develop and was reflecting on their own development as well as a, a call to the profession, um, if you like, that we really need to develop our intellectual agency and the importance of challenging um, what they saw as still an anti-intellectual culture that exists in parts in education um, and the, the work that we need to do around that. Um, this participant also noted, you know, that the, the role of the head teacher isn't what it was even 10 years ago. Um, and actually it's becoming more and more important to be able to take that step back to interrogate policy at that global level, as well as the local level to understand it through the research lens, to understand the counter agendas that are at play. Um, and having this academic element, as uh, she described it in the, the interview, was really needed because that gave one of the strong foundations to develop your own really strong rationale for practice. And that was core to that sense of agency there. And another participant talked about the relevance of this work and having the reading, the thinking, that critical engagement and reflecting on how relevant it all had to be. You can't just shoehorn things in. It's not reading stuff for the sake of it. It's not um, finding a strategic change for the sake of going through it, but actually you really have to be living it. And that was one of the real strengths of the programme was living it and learning it simultaneously. And that relevance of both was absolutely critical in being able to progress in that way. Um, part of that, of course, is also related to their own evolving identity and greater understanding of themselves and themselves as a leader. And that came out really strongly um, as linked to values. And again, Julie's already touched on this and the importance of values as a leader. And we can see that iterational dimension of examining one's own values, constantly revisiting these, being aware of them, focusing on them, making sense of that from building on multiple perspectives and how that really came through as people were talking about their sense of values and how they evolved and, are, and continue to evolve through the process. Um, and that was also connected to this sense for some about an intrinsic purpose and motivations and driver, both for being on into headship as part of the study and the learning, but also for their own leadership practice. And for some that perhaps um, COVID brought that more sharply into focus. And for them seeing that translated in practice, so not just in the, the learning sphere, but in the practice of leadership, it was absolutely about really knowing what's actually important here and that values position being upfront and central there. But the learning dimension of that was having that space to be able to take the step back and critically examine one's own values and how that connects and how that shapes who you are as a leader um, and being confident that that is okay and that is who and, and who you are um, in your own development. Some talked about it as knowing their own stance, the understanding why, and there was a number of references throughout that this was about being able to justify that position, justify a set of actions. And I think that's part of that sense of agency and that, that voice that's coming through. Um, there was a perception that some found that far more challenging. Um, and the perception here, and this of course is perception and observations of others, is that perhaps the motivations were different and where the motivations to engage came more from a driver around career progression, or as some described it, I have to get the qualification, that that was maybe then reflected differently um, in that kind of moral purpose and really understanding self. So I think what it identified, what, what we're maybe starting to see come through is that people are at really different starting places as they come into, into headship. And as they begin to tussle with and think about those values, they then are on, um, it's not a starting point, but as part of that process, they are really beginning to, to work out who they are as a leader. And they will come through that at different stages, depending on all the multiple factors. And I think that's well demonstrated in that model of agency that Julie talked about at the start. So thinking about the values, thinking about who you are and really knowing yourself as a leader was, of course, really important. And that, again, wasn't just an academic piece that was about you know, standing back and reflecting, but was very much about how that was being experienced in the day-to-day -day, 
um, practice of leading in schools, particularly during that crisis that really amplified some dimensions more than others. A third really important, and of course, all of these dimensions are absolutely interrelated with each other as well, is that notion of trust. And it's perhaps unsurprising that this has come through as a core dimension, both within the learning spaces and the practice spaces, that we can't make much progress, we can't build um, our relationships or move things forward, our values position absolutely is interlinked and um, deeply underpinned by issues of trust. Now that came through differently depending on the, the thinking around the learning space and the thinking around the practice space. For within the cohort, trust was seen um, as really critically important for that social dimension of learning. And we think this was you know, framed much more around that need to create safe spaces and trusted spaces where people could show up and be open, be vulnerable in their learning. This is a really hard course. It's a really challenging thing. Developing as a leader and leadership and headship is really challenging. So having that safe space to be vulnerable, to not know, to expose your, your own thinking and interrogate that, you need to build those trusting relationships. You need to be able to challenge each other and that needs to be able to be done in supported ways. And that was something that um, individuals reported as being really important, but also where some tensions emerged um, within cohorts. And sometimes that was related to where individuals perceived that there was maybe um, a sense of competitiveness emerging and perhaps looking um, ahead to being in that job market, having that qualification and looking for the headship post, particularly perhaps in a secondary context where there are naturally fewer posts um, emerging there. So that was one tension that, that was identified here. Um, but another, was around and one participant described this as having to be politically savvy in the sessions with their cohort members of that feeling of not wanting to cause disruption or have any washback was the the term that was used um, and that seemed to be felt most acutely when the cohort was either comprised of a single local authority or maybe a larger number of one local authority over another within um, a cohort so people felt more identifiable and there was perhaps even some power relationships within the cohorts particularly if central team members were also part of the cohort and being able to show up and and talk about and critique the work that was happening and the space that they were working in and their actual leadership practices and so some felt that they had to go out with the cohort to find that safe space because it wasn't um, they weren't able to create that in the, the cohort itself. Now, part of that was also um, touching on the impact of COVID and having to be online and how we, we operate differently and we build relationships differently within that online space. But that was only one small part of it. There were those bigger issues about the power relations, about the dynamics and about creating those safe spaces for discussion and the, the vulnerability um, that was talked about. Um, and of course, the, the need to build relationships is absolutely essentially important in into headship and other um, you know, learning programs as well. Um, and where people go to find that, the formal networks, the informal networks, the spaces that were really helpful, like um, the WhatsApp spaces that emerged, but also these brought tensions because they were also seen as being spaces that actually could nurture the negativity and not just be the spaces for support. And um, a number of participants commented that actually it was perhaps a small but rather vocal minority within these spaces. And again, looking at the, the challenges people were bringing and what that negativity was related to was around, of course, unsurprisingly, workload pressures in the system, managing study alongside um, leading during a time of crisis when things are highly pressurized. But again, digging underneath that, because I think we will always have pressures of workload. We always have pressures of time. Some of what we might see, and of course, this is an early stage of analysis, so we need to, to go back into this, is perhaps 
unpicking some of those fear-based responses that people are bringing some of that negativity because actually that learning process is really hard and that brings a challenge, it brings a discomfort. And so we tend to um, respond in a ways that we can find a safe space. So by um, claiming that the workload is too hard or the readings are too hard or not appropriate, we're maybe not allowing ourselves to actually challenge ourselves and our thinking in what we're learning and in that learning space. So being aware of those kind of fear-based responses. And I think that's something that is really helpful for us to consider in taking forward the, the programme and how we work with people. Trust was also really key in terms of how trust is perceived within the system for these emerging or newly appointed um, school leaders. And of course, this is absolutely a multi-layered, multi-directional um, issue. And uh, you know something we're not gonna manage to untangle in this session alone. But some of the, the aspects of that were around being um, perceived to be trusted or not by the authority or by the system. What levels of trust are there for schools and for individual school leaders in the system and where things were perceived to close down, perhaps because of the impact of COVID, um, there was then perceived to be less trust, less empowerment, less agency because the system was um, responding in that kind of crisis moment. Similarly, um, or maybe in the opposite of that, others were looking at where trust was, you know, maybe more so in school as they focused on some key priorities, well-being of course being one of them, but now as we move back into a space of looking at performance measures and attainment outcomes and moving out of that kind of well-being recovery phase as seems to be the case, that actually there's a greater lack of trust in the system emerging again. Um, there was a, quite a significant mention of a blame culture and that culture of performativity that sits around that, that doesn't give space for people to be vulnerable, doesn't give space for schools to take risks, to try things um, and evolve because there are such tight measures to be able to meet certain standards or certain requirements. So therefore um, people either look to blame or label other problematic areas. We have problem families, problem staff, difficult staff, difficult context without actually having the space to really um, take different approaches to what they're doing. So that trust in the system is really important. Another way that that came through was around this notion of being given a voice um, and that that was something in the gift of someone else, whether that's an authority or um, a central team, whatever that happens to be, that you had a voice, you had a seat at the table, you were fitting the mould of a local authority. And perhaps that was to do with being perceived as having maybe a high attaining school or meeting certain targets. Um, but quite often we heard things that seem to sit around um, this worry about, it's actually about compliance, we're not allowed to challenge. Um, we're, there, there's a fear of being able to bring up and look at alternative approaches and um, this notion of repercussions if we're not doing something, or as one uh, participant described it, needing to hold the line of the local authority. Um, and if one is able to present themselves in that image, whether that is through how you show up at sessions, whether it's through approaches you take in school, whether it's that public persona on Twitter, but fitting that mold, in whatever way was seen as something that was valuable and that mold tended to be something that was far more about compliance and not challenge in the system. Um, and one person described that as learning how to play the game in the local authority. And that had implications not only for how people felt they were in, able to enact their leadership and make decisions within their school context, they also felt that was impacting on those opportunities for career progression um, and where they might be able to go and how they would then be nurtured in the system um, into future headship positions. Connected to this is the, the sense around the relational dimensions of headship, the, rela the relational dimensions of learning as well. 
Um, as part of the learning process, participants explored the nature of the, the relationships they had and the importance of being in a space together, whether virtual or um, in person, but how important it was to have that space to construct understandings together, to build the networks, what that real learning with and from each other looks like, and the supports that they built with each other as well. Um, and this, the social dimension within the cohort. And this was, I think, quite uniquely impacted through COVID in terms of what could be achieved in online spaces. Um, and it was certainly impeded in some ways and other ways people talked about how things were made more accessible and able to build smaller networks and connect with each other in different ways because of the online dimension. But ultimately, they reflected on the importance of the relationships. They also reflected not just on their own building of relationships, but the importance of the learning they did as part of the, the formal part of the programme about the importance of relationships in leadership and the relationships in school and that community building and understanding each other. And that came through um, in a number of participants as being a really significant aspect of their learning and practice. Um, significant for the focus of relationships in their leadership practice. And I think, again, this is something that is really unsurprising perhaps in data about leadership and enacting leadership that relationships are important but how COVID really amplified it and how COVID really brought to the fore the importance of some dimensions um, and how important building those relationships are and what happens when the physical relationships are severely impacted or severed altogether, the impact of that on building that community of working together, how you have to operate differently to be able to sustain and nurture relationships when you can't actually physically bring people together. Um, throughout the data, we heard a lot about needing compassion, empathy, being able to lead with care and connection. One participant um, commented that previously they had been told that they were too much of a soft touch and implicit in that was that would be no good for them as a leader. And their reflection is they had obviously been listening to the wrong people because what they have learned from this process is how important that is, that leading with care and connection and compassion. We heard again, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, the word anxiety came through a lot in our data. And that was anxiety of individual participants in their study. It was the anxiety for staff in schools, the anxiety experienced by children, young people, families, that whole um, piece around anxiety and well-being for all and the importance of really focusing on that and the need to deeply understand how we can work differently in terms of supporting well-being for all. Um, with a number kind of reflecting that again, that focus seems to have dwindled a bit already and we're not, we shouldn't be ready to move away from that. We should be focusing on that more. But again, it's that tension in the system of looking to a return to the more um, performative measures. Um, we heard of people, you know, really seeing that actually it's time to speak to people on a human level and really understand individuals and make that connection um, and reiterating the sense of relationships being important to underpin everything that they do. Um, I think we could probably dig into this a lot more and talk a lot more about the importance of well-being and where we could go in this. Um, but I'm also very aware of time, so I shall move on a little bit. Um, what, one of the things that we set out to do at the beginning of this was really trying to understand what was it about the learning and the leadership during this crisis, during what somebody described as the turbulent times, that really has made a difference. Um, Somebody commented that a few individuals pulled this out in the data that there was something about leading during a crisis or doing this during a crisis that made it better. It made it a better learning experience for them and really trying to understand what is it? What is it about this at this time that's actually made that difference? And yes, we can see things like the focus on relationships, but also things like dealing with uncertainty. And that was brought to the fore because obviously everyone was dealing with uncertainty. So they really had to develop an understanding about that, get comfortable with uncertainty, being adaptable and responsive and finding that into headship helped to give 
that um, structure and navigation to help them make sense of all of that. But again, we could maybe argue that these things exist in the calm times as well. And uncertainty is always there. We just maybe forget that that uncertainty is there. So how can we learn from that as we think about being able to manage, cope with, embrace these periods of uncertainty um, in our learning and in our practice? And of course, then the support, the networks and the building capacity at that more strategic level within either a school, a local authority or nationally and what that looks like and how we build and nurture a pool of leaders who are experiencing and have experienced programmes such as Headship to be able to build a more strategic approach in nurturing our future school leaders. Um, and I shall just move on now to this slide. Uh, what we would like to do now is take a pause from one of us speaking and look to start off some discussion. We've identified here some of the possible challenges for us, for the programme, for the system, based on the, the data and the themes that we have pulled out. There may be other things that you've heard in the session today that you think are more important or you're wondering why it isn't there, what silences are there? So we would love to turn over now to a bit of critical discussion. Great, thanks very much, Zoe. So there's already been some really interesting points raised in the chat. So Nova um, so far has raised quite a few really interesting aspects um, in relation to what's been shared so far. So Zoe, I wonder if I could come to you first to reflect on, on Nova's thoughts. She's talking about the dynamic between professional learning or folk who are coming into the internship programme as, you know, with the motivation of professional learning and those who are coming in because they absolutely have to. And you've mentioned that already in terms of some folks' experiences. Is there anything more you want to say about the kind of tension and dynamic between those two groups of people? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Nova. I think this is a really interesting one. And I think it's one that we we want to explore more because obviously this is quite at early stages and it is changing the profile of into headship. And you know, some of the things that were reflected through the data was people recognizing that conflict. Yes, wouldn't it be wonderful if everyone really wanted to do this and was driven by purely intrinsic motivations, but that's also not the reality. And the need for having something that was mandatory because that was a good thing and recognizing the qualification itself and the purposes behind that. But as soon as you mandate anything, you are going to instantly change the dynamic and the profile and making it a have to will we'll have that influence there. So how do we reconcile these two things? And I think one of the, the interesting, I'm going to think about one of the micro stories. So one participant's story here, and they reflected that they came into, into headship um, as a have to, and, you know, with some desire to engage in the process as well. So I don't mean to, to make it sound negative, and that was the only motivation, but it was, I need the qualification because I know headship is my route. I've done a bit of an acting stint previously, and I really want to do this. I've tried something else that didn't quite work. So I have to get this qualification now and I'm, I'm ready, whatever our readiness means here. And they reflected a bit on there was, you know, the mechanics of going through the process and a bit of the, why am I having to do this reading? I'm not seeing where this connects together. It's a lot of stuff coming in. But they reflected that quite quickly they realised the relevance and the importance of all that coming together. And by the end, one of their reflections was writing that final assignment was one of the best parts of the learning experience. I mean, who knew, who would say that? Writing assignments, the best part. But actually that was that synthesizing of the thinking, the ideas and the reflecting back on everything that had been done and how relevant everything was and realizing the difference that had made in their own thinking and who they were now as a leader. And they were reflecting now, and that was somebody who has just taken up a headship post that, that has absolutely made a difference. And yes, they could have easily have been a head teacher before, but they would have been a very different kind of head teacher. And they now know their values position and the relationships and, the, and how they were taking it forward. So I don't think, in possibly in an answer to your question, I think some people will come in and they will perform in it and they will exit. And that will be the case. 
others will evolve and shift. And I think there will be a complex mix of factors influencing there. But the more that we can do to recognize that, and I think continually connect the relevance of the learning as part of the program absolutely has to be part of the practice. That for me, I think is the way to, to try and begin to reconcile some of that. I don't know if Julia or Kevin want to, to come in. Anything from you, Julie? No, I, I think, no, Nova, did you want to respond to that? No, I was just, I was just going to say thanks, um, Zoe. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. It was, it was that notion of, you know, what, it, it, is there a part in the journey where they think, oh, I didn't, I didn't really want to do this, but actually now that I'm doing it, I actually quite like it or, you know, and I think that's, it, you know, we can't legislate for people coming in because they have to come in. Um, we can't really, sort of, but I suppose what you're saying is we can mitigate against the circumstances by making it really relevant and appropriate for them. Um, and I think it's really hopeful that there are stories like that where people say, actually, ah, now I get it, I understand what that, that reading was about, I understand what that model, how that model can, can be applied to my own setting. Um, that's really interesting, thanks Zoe. One of the things that interviewee said was, I realised I needed to trust the process, the process being the interheadship process. And for me, I was like, oh, I think that that's the thing I would like all new cohorts to know. Trust the process. It will all come together, because I think that is a really Im important insight to, to bring to it. Great. Thank you very much, Nova. We're going to pick up on a point from Nicola next. I don't know, Nicola, do you want to unmute in? share your question or I'm happy to share it for you if you wish. Yeah, Kevin, yeah, I can. Sorry, just getting to the, all the buttons there. <laughs> um, I thought it was really interesting. Um, thanks for the presentation. And there's a couple of things. I think um, I was really interested in your use of um, the agency framework that Julie introduced. And I know that you're in the early phases of, of kind of analysing this data, but is there any thoughts you've got in relation to that framework and your data, um, you know, any initial thoughts on it? Yeah, um, Nicola, thanks for your question. Um, so I think the idea of, you know, the iterational factors, so this idea of professional development, professional learning, time to reflect, that really came through. Um, so in terms of one of the candidates that I spoke to that was, you know, getting interviewed, they talked about the focus and values as being really really significant and they said that they had gone actually they were in an acting um head sorry they had they were in a, a a substantive head teacher post when i interviewed them and they said they would if it hadn't been for the the the, the reading and the reflection the focusing and values um that they had got on into headship they wouldn't have had the confidence to go for the head teacher post which i thought was really quite significant so that real you know that that kind of um understanding of leadership and their, their development of professional identity, I think comes into that iterational factors. But another thing that came through um, in terms of the practical evaluative aspect was this idea of activity and accountability and how difficult it is. So one of the candidates who's, she was a head teacher as well. She, she had been acting heads during into headship, um, but she, she had reflected that she was so glad that she was reading and doing research while she was in that position, she said, because it all seemed to make so much sense, especially the focus and values um, and, and re the relational aspects of leadership, which came to the fore during, you know, the, the, the pandemic. Um, so I think this, uh, this idea, but she, what she said was that now that we're still kind of in the pandemic situation or the, the, the situation of uncertainty, and yet we're being driven by attainment again. So uh, there's something here around as what Zoe, you know, what Zoe touched on about this, um, this the structures, the culture that we're that the Scottish education system is operating in, and this idea of relational trust. You know, where is the trust of the head teacher? Where the 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 dialogue is around empowerment, but actually, um, if the, the the dialogue's all around, you know, the the, the pressure is all around performativity and attainment then you know there's a real tension there so i think that is something and to me within the into headship course we need to develop practitioners confidence and challenging um this drive of performativity and attainment and, and because you know if we are empowering head teachers 
um, and they do know their own context and they do know what's best for the, the, the pupils, there, there has to be some kind of um, reflexive accountability built into the system. So, um, so I see those two particular areas. Nicola, I hope that answers your, your question. Yeah, thanks, Julie. It's so nice to hear you both talking about that challenging performativity and that the, the sense that you're getting from the data of the, the agency and the empowerment that the, the head teachers felt um, or people in those in, in those leadership roles felt. And um, it's interesting you you saying looking to do that into the into the in, in the in the programme. So uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I think that is. I mean, one of the one of the great things that happened during the reaccreditation process, and it was something that was said during the reaccreditation event at GTCS, and I think commended in the process afterwards. Interheadship was not designed to create a new group of policy implementers. It was designed to develop that critical capacity. And that's what's been accredited. That's what is built on in that national design group. And I think that that's a great strength in the system that we have that. And there is the rhetoric there, but it's bringing all of these aspects of the system together and how, how we try and facilitate and support and build it and recognize that there are challenges. I, I think we see the, a similar thing in ITE as we do in leadership development. You know, we don't want to set people up for failure to go out and go challenge the system. And the first thing that happens is they don't get jobs because they're seen as challenging the system. But how we do that and how 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 across the system we work together to support and facilitate it, I guess. I don't have answers, but I definitely have the question. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. We've got another question here from Ian, who is from the University of Aberdeen. I don't know if you can unmic Ian or if you want me to state your question for you. Yeah, thanks. It, it, it's actually partly being covered just now by Julie and Zoe, and it's a bit of kind of crystal ball gazing, really. It's just oh, it seems to be bad timing with the clock. Um, it's it's just crystal ball gazing as to what footprint in terms of approaches to leadership may stick when hopefully turbulence has <laughs> elapsed, and yeah, that that context of trust partly through necessity, et cetera, what will be left there. And I was interested also in, would there be any sense of actually influence in structure and focus within programs like Interheadship? So yeah, structurally in schools, what, what you think might be a lasting impact and will there be any amendments to approaches in, in terms of leadership programs? I'm very sorry, I see I'm listed as SO2 IP7. I, can I confirm I am not a secret agent? Well, that would have been I, interesting. That would have added was, a different dimension yeah, yeah. altogether. Um, I, I can offer my thoughts on that. I think in terms of our leadership programmes, I think one of the things that I went into this study thinking, um, and it was a bit of, I don't know what the right word is, concern, you know, as, as Julie outlined at the beginning, there are calls internationally about what, what are relevant leadership preparation programmes given the, the challenges from COVID. Are we preparing leaders appropriately? What will that look like? No, we don't have crystal balls, but what, what's our best guesses here? And I think I did think, goodness, what if something really big comes out here and it's a fundamental shake and we got it completely wrong and into headship and what will that look like? And I, I can reflect on the start of one of the interviews I did and the participant was starting to say you know this whole thing isn't right that wasn't exact words but it was you know the implication I thought oh th this is going to be the unraveling of it all what's happening here but actually what what was being said and I think this is for me the, the takeaway message is it's the, those bigger dimensions those underpinning dispositions skills that I think we do have right on into headship because absolutely the values piece is critically important. Absolutely, how we understand and we think about relationships, I think is critically important. It is about that very, the very nature of the criticality, the questioning, the thinking, but what is core to, and I think what's, what's great about into headship is this isn't a course that's about let's 
investigate all these conceptions of leadership and here's 10 models of leadership that we'll interrogate today and go away this is the right model and it's not about specific content but it is about saying right what are the big thorny critical issues that you are dealing with that you will need to take forward and think about in your school and it's using that as a critical lens to understand things like values understand who you are as a leader and how you evolve and develop in that way so for me I think these things are adaptable and responsive and they're not content driven so they are more flexible um, and certainly I think from some of the reflections from the the data um, where people were talking about that they were talking about the absolute relevance of what they were doing and the things that had to change were how they manage some of those situations in the context so I might still be doing this in school how I was going to engage with staff totally had to change because we weren't in the building together or we're online so I'm having to understand how I do that and the importance of those things in different ways but actually the fact that I'm having to engage with staff that's still a core thing that I'm thinking about so I don't think and this is you know maybe at early stages and I'll change my mind as we get into the data more or things evolve but at the moment I don't think we're at a stage of having to go back to square one and work out that the, the design of the programme is fundamentally wrong. I think there are tweaks, absolutely, and there are things that we need to learn from it. And, and that is an important piece, but actually maybe those foundational principles are still pretty good solid principles to be building on for the system at the moment, but others may, may disagree and have a different perception on that. Julia, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, well, my thoughts around that as well, you were talking about, you know, changes in school. I think perhaps COVID has made um, change inevitable. You know, things have had to change. People who perhaps had been entrenched, cultures that were, you know, entrenched have been shaken. So perhaps this is, you know, a prime time for um, for change to happen. And I think that, you know, as, as educational leaders, we needed to identify things that we now want to change forever. You know, we don't we don't want to go back to what was perhaps normal. I do think as well that um, in the climate of the, the recent OECD report, so things have been highlighted. For example, the you know the, the senior phase in secondary school, that the attainment driven day, uh, agenda, that has been opened now up for for question. And again, through through the the, the COVID crisis, you know. It was teacher judgment had to be used. We couldn't have exams. So again, things that we didn't think were possible to change have changed. So I think this could possibly be a, an opportunistic time for us, um, you know, and for for educational leaders to to grasp, to seize the moment, to to make their voice heard in terms of um, kicking back against this relentless performativity. Um, so that's thank it. you. I, I think <laughs> I think you know parallel to all this as well is the obviously the, the refresh duty share standards, not just a standard for headship. And yeah, Zoe, it's refreshing to hear you stress the values aspect because I think that theme is is you know a core around which we, we can we'll continue to build. And and just finally, few re into headship. It wasn't a proposal for <laughs> all scale changes. So. Oh, I can go and have my tea happy. Thank you. Well, Ian, that was a seamless link when you mentioned values there, because our next question from Angela uh, links into values and identity as well. Angela, do you want to unmake and share your question? Yeah, no worries. Uh, sorry, I'll also switch off my calendar in the background. Apologies. Yeah. It wasn't actually a question. It just was as an observation. I think that um, across all of the presentations so far, not just this one, but the other two CIRA events as well, there is that notion of knowing yourself as a teacher, but also in, because of your uh, sessions focus very much about leadership, it's how do you respond and how that then shapes identity further. So I found that really quite fascinating. And I also really liked hearing about the response of the participant um, because it moves it from being that have to, I have to do it into how do I understand myself and how do I make sense of everything that's going on around about us. So it's not a, a question per se, it's actually just a comment just to say really fascinating, looking forward to see what comes out of it. Thanks Angela. I think these are really interesting things to explore and you know, like I say I, I certainly don't have answers to everything but that 
knowing yourself as you're describing there I think that can apply to so many dimensions and you know I, I, I picked out a little bit about you know is there a fear-based response and is that fear-based response you know because this this fits really hard so it's easy to say oh, I don't need to be doing that reading I've got too much workload you know where I prioritize my time um and I think we we can all do that to a certain extent but really understanding ourselves and having but you need the support and the space to be able to do that to be vulnerable and to be able to learn and you know some people will have that space and some people will have their own networks where they can do it even if they don't have it in the, the formalized professional spaces but are there things that we can be doing differently as a system in programs across ITE and, and continuing teacher education and I don't know what that would look like but I think you know we are in a good place that we certainly have it in the policy sphere around a values position are we enacting that values position across the board I'm not so sure um but maybe that is a collective voice that the more people we bring together the more that we can develop our strategic leaders in the system to do that as well as um early phase teachers will that create a groundswell that will help to see a culture change more holistically i think as well so that is all your point there about vulnerability i think that the pandemic has taught us not just to be resilient or certainly help us to think more resiliently but acknowledging that it's okay to be vulnerable so i think that's a really good point you've made can i just come in there so one of my the, the, the participants that i interviewed she had recently taken up her post as a head teacher and she was um, having an in-service day the following day after the interview and she said she was looking at values with her staff because of the, the value that she'd found in, on, on into headship of, of really examining values. So she wanted to, she was very brave and talking about vulnerability, she was going to ask the staff to reflect on how well she demonstrates her, the values that she espouses, which I thought was quite brave of her. But she felt so strongly about it um, and as I say you know she said that if it hadn't been for all the work on into headship and the deflection she wouldn't have gone for a head teacher post so I thought that was quite refreshing so I think that's something that we take away that that you know that real focus on values is something that's worthwhile um, yeah. I wonder while we're still kind of talking around the issues around relationships and renewal post COVID Nova could we bring you back in to kind of share your thinking around the how you repair the fallout of COVID-19 because you mentioned there in the chat about how we have to look across it in schools in terms of our leadership in schools but also in terms of higher education as well is there anything you want to say about that? Yeah I just I thought it was interesting I think when um, Zoe um, was speaking about that notion of of the, the sort of fallout and it's kind of one of those things that I think is oh, sorry that's the bad times of phone to start with. <laughs> There is a teenager in the house, but there's no chance she's going to answer it, so <laughs> that would be helpful. <laughs> um, yeah, so I lost my train of thought. Um, I think that there's maybe something about that sort of recovery from COVID that, that we we haven't come across yet, and I wonder if, if some of the data that you collect in, in, in your study is beginning to show some of that, you know, some of those things where actually oh that that space for relationships is an issue and and, and it's something we've been reflecting on in, in with IT and also with like our, our sort of continuing masters PGT um, courses and, and lots of the students are saying we miss that connection you know it's 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 different online and it is and we, we know that you know this is different online um you know we don't get to sort of you know, sally to the bar and continue the conversation over a sobbing young after this, which is very disappointing. Um, but the relationships are different online, and it's that kind of, I suppose I was just not really a question, just kind of reflecting on is that something we're going to have to consider across the piece? Because if, if, if you think about um, pupils in, in primary schools and secondary schools, how long ago it was since they had a proper educational year and what has been that impact and then what will that impact be on those S6s for example who haven't had a proper year since S3 what's going to happen when they come into higher education and what does that do for for the, the experiences of the sort of social aspects and the yeah it's just it, yeah there wasn't really a question in there Kevin I don't think sorry it was just, I think it's just a really fascinating thing to to um to explore 
Absolutely. And it's such an important thing to explore too. And I think, as you say, there hasn't been a normal year for so long now. And I do think we've got a bit of a, you know, a, almost a, a way of working where we think, right, we'll, we'll plow forward and we'll move forward positively. And we'll get on with you know, business as usual. But I think, you know, the reflections from the interviews that we've been doing is that it isn't business as usual, really. And folk can't get back to that business as usual way of working at the moment because of the restrictions that they're under so how they then overcome that and bring people with them to try and you know re-inspire folk to engage in professional learning to re-inspire folk in terms of school improvement priorities there's a huge amount of work to be done and how do you do that when folk are still absolutely knackered and are still busted through the process so i think that definitely came up in, in a lot of the conversations yeah. with that. so far does anybody else want to say anything about that I think, Kevin, that, that point that you're just finishing on there, that came through in our interview data. And I think one of the phrases that a participant uses, the tank is empty. And I think the tank is empty across the system. And, you know, I look at colleagues within higher education, our teacher educator colleagues, the tank is empty. It's the same in schools, yet the pressures to, you know, ramp up again, whatever that might mean. And I'm not sure we have the energy quite for it. There needs to be a bit of time of stability, recharge, connection, focus there. Um, I do wonder what that means as we look ahead to education reform agendas and changes in the system and consultations. You know, I, I agree, Julie, with what you're saying. There's an opportunity perhaps for really big fundamental change that might actually make a huge difference long term in the system. I worry a little bit that is the tank too empty for people to really embrace that and get it right at this time. Um, I know that's a slight digression from where we're going in, in the data here, but I think you know having the, these kind of discussions are re it's really important. I, I would think. And I think that's one of the things the the strategic leadership learning that our participants have been involved with has hopefully empowered them to do because I think it's on almost a daily basis. An evaluation of are folk ready for this? Is it the right time to do the thing I'm planning to do today? And being reflexive um, and reflective about you know what they have to make changes to in terms of school improvement priorities and in terms of the pace of change as well. That links almost beautifully and seamlessly to the point that Charlene um, has brought up about that tension between we have to get on with certain parts of the day job because head teachers have responsibilities and that came through in the data as well in terms of them feeling that they had to move forward in some ways, but there's still that you know huge tension around um, the well-being aspect of it, but also in terms of the tension with the compliance agenda as well. Charlene, do you want to come in and share your question? Hi, thanks very much for the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I suppose my kind of question, you kept on using the word trust, and that's the thing that I sort of grabbed onto, because one of the things I, I really like how you're using the, um, the agency uh, framework, um, because one of the things that, I mean, Zoe, you've already touched on it a bit, I think, when you're talking about head teachers have got to be compliant because they're in a system there's no autonomy you, you know we always talk about teachers being autonomous and stuff, but are we really no we're in a framework of accountability and I, I suppose I was just wondering about what's come out in the data and and how, what are people feeling about what does trust actually mean what the head, if you trust a head teacher what does that actually mean in a school context what does it mean in a system context because we use the word, but do we all mean the same thing by the word? Or does it mean, is it permission? Is it, uh, you know, is it being autonomous? What, what is the sort of phrase? And that, that just, I was, I was just kind of going down that road. And I mean, I was thinking about professionalism and thinking about, so how does trust, professionalism, accountability, responsibility, compliance, all of these are tensions that head teachers have got to negotiate constantly. And I really like the idea, and I, I, I mean, I really like the interheadship um, model. And I think that that idea of theory and practice together is absolutely perfect. And as I think as Zoe said earlier, that you're learning while you're doing and, and the academic, right? So it's just really, uh, is there anything, is there anything coming out in your data that sort of talks about that, that trust and, and what does that mean? And what does that look like? And it's just, that's the thing that's really sort of caught me into the, Thanks, Charlene. Um, I think I think there are some things coming out, and 
I think this is something that we can go back in and I, I would agree. I think there are a number of, you know, the hurrah terms around the system that we don't have shared understandings around at all. And we can mean quite different things when we use the word trust and what we think that that looks like mm -hmm. in the system. So uh, that is really important to unpick and explore. And I think that the same could be said for a number of things. Yeah. My kind of instant observations on that is that notion of a framework of accountability. And I don't think it's necessarily helpful to polarise the need for accountability as being a bad thing. Well, and absolutely. That actually, we are accountable and we should be. Mm -hmm. And we're accountable for many things. It's who we're accountable to and when, yes. and it's what we're accountable for and how. And the accountability measures are predominantly stuck within that quite narrow view yes. of attainment, outcomes, performance. Um, and that I think is not helpful and not helpful for trust in a, a wider sense. Some of the things that I think have come through the data in terms of what trust means, and um, I'll link that back to just trying to think of specific examples of what people have said, it is about being able to really know and justify what you're doing and being able to give that position. I think one participant has said, you know, it's about me being able to say to the local authority, I know you want data X, but I know my school needs this. Yeah. And here's how and why. And yeah. that's what I'm going to do. And the trust in the system that actually, as a really critically knowledgeable leader, I have that ability, I have that justification, and I have that knowledge to do it. And so I should be trusted to do that. So I think that's one example of what that trust looks like. But I think that's only one example. I think there are other things that would be interesting to go in and unpick more what trust means and what that looks like across the system. And I think that's not just a unidirectional of does the local authority trust the head teacher? That trust has to sit in other ways and with other groups as well. So that there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Thanks, Sorry, that's Yeah, it's, it's one of these ones you go, yeah, you want to just keep on picking at that scab, aren't you? It's crazy. <laughs> You're just going to keep on going, yeah, okay, and what does this mean? What does this mean? No, but thank you for that. I just wanted to um, just endorse what Zoe said about, you know, that, that idea of giving participants the wider perspective, really being secure about why they're doing what they're doing, research informed. So mm -hmm. the idea that actually they can justify, they've got the vocabulary, they, they've got the confidence, the resilience um, to defend what they're doing, to talk about their context. Um, I think that is key to, to gaining trust, you mm -hmm. know. So interesting as well to reflect on what trust looks like at different levels and within different relationships within the system as well because i think one of the you know the themes that have come out is about you know trust in terms of hierarchical trust but that trust within school communities has in some instances been improved because teams have had to do you know incredible things together they've had to do work they've never done before take on responsibilities never had before and that's built relational trust within staff teams there's also been you know, a lot of discussion around trust with parents and the fact that relationships with parents has, have changed because they can't come into the school. There's not the same sort of sense of community that there was before in schools. So how do we rebuild that level of trust as well? So I think trust, you're right, Charlie, and I wrote down trust in capital letters in my notebook when I was listening along because that was a major thing that came out for me as well. Just building on, on the back of that, Zoe, I was wondering about, you mentioned about fear-based responses. How much do you think that's been accelerated by COVID and how much do you think that is, is part of the nature and identity of, of leaders in the system? My guess is quite a lot. <laughs> and, um, need to go back and look at the data to substantiate my position on that. But I, I think it has, and I think in different ways as well. And I could even just look at it at a, a very individual and very personal. When you know you go through different kind of way whether it's through coaching processes or other um personal development learning processes I'm not phrasing this particularly well really knowing yourself and understanding what your responses are based on and recognizing in yourself when you actually are having a fear-based response and I think you know quite often we can have those reactions the things that jar with us the things that we find problematic can quite often sit at that point and 
knowing that as an individual, I think it's a really powerful piece. It's not necessarily going to say that you're never going to have that fear-based response <laughs> or you're not going to move from that, but understanding how that impacts and influences you, I think then allows you to think differently about that. And that's just one person, one individual and how you do it. System-wide, if we start to recognise these things, and I guess maybe one of the things that we can think about in into headship is how we might expose that, and I, I mean expose in the most supportive way, and build capacity with people in being able to understand themselves and where those responses are coming from, because that's maybe not something that we have done or that we can do in the space of time. Um, and I'm not sure that that's something that might necessarily come out through an ESCI and, and that coaching at the point in time that it happens in into headship, but maybe these are some of the the dimensions that are worth exploring. But that's a very quick response of something that I've not really thought through yet, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, sorry to put you on the spot there. It was just it was really linking to something I was was thinking through around how you know COVID has accelerated trends that were already there in lots of different fields, but obviously in education as well. And I do wonder if things like the almost kind of hyper focus on attainment and attainment driven uh, performance measures has been accelerated because of COVID and also the kind of focus on well-being and the focus on relationships has been accelerated too because we've had to focus on it. It's been absolutely necessary and crucial to do that over the last couple of years. So I do wonder if that is one of the effects that we're seeing in the early data that we've got around some of the trends that we knew were there in education before and how they've been accelerated in terms of the times of COVID. Julie, do you want to say anything about that? Just to, um, you know, teachers that I interviewed or you know, candidates that I interviewed were talking about the need that they had to trust their staff because everything went remote. So as before they felt in control, there was, you know, that control was taken away from them and there was this need for trust. One of the, the teachers that I spoke to said that she was so glad that she had built up that kind of relational trust beforehand because um, you know, she felt more, much more confident and people just knew what they had to do. So um, just, you know, I, I, but it, it's interesting, I suppose, just from, you know, leadership point of view, what impact on the style of leadership um, what, what impact COVID will have on, on certain styles of leadership, perhaps there'll be a much more maybe notions towards distributive leadership styles now, perhaps, than there was before because of the COVID. So that'll be interesting to, to explore further, I suppose. Absolutely. I think that thing about leadership styles is really crucial because I think both in terms of leaders' own style, but also the styles that they've experienced from above and in our parts of the system has been different. I think there's been a lot more command and control in terms of a lot of the health and safety measures and a lot of the kind of compliance that's been necessary, the folk have experienced in the system as well. And is that going to be a residue that we have for a long time in, in folks' leadership style in school and in our parts of the system as well? So interesting point. Anybody else last kind of opportunity to come in if they want to ask a question or any other points that folk want to make before we wrap up? Okay, I'll pass back to you then, Zoe and Julie, for any final thoughts before we close? Thank you, Kevin. No, nope, I think I've, I've really enjoyed the, the discussion this afternoon. So thank you for the questions and responses. I think these are the kind of spaces that are great to have and to be able to tussle through, through some of these ideas. So thank you. Yep, thank you, everybody. And um, thanks for your questions and your comments. And thank you to Nicola as part of the CIRA team for facilitating this. Um, much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you both. It's been great. And as Angela said, real links between what we've heard in the uh, presentations so far this week. So, yeah, looking forward to more. Thank you both. Really great. Can I great. ask Nicola Thanks what so will much. happen to the recording? Is it going to be made available? Yeah, the recording. I need to send it to Derek, do I? Yeah, yeah. If you send it to Derek through we transfer Zoe, um, if you just stop it and then you'll be able to access it and send it through to him. That's perfect. And then it'll be up online on our YouTube channel and on website. <laughs> Thank you.